In this video, we're going to look at IPv6 versus IPv4 and see what makes them different. Let's get started. In this video, we're looking at IPv6 and in particular, how it differs from IPv4. Since we just talked about network address translation, NAT, we should mention that IPv6 takes away the motivation for using NAT. The purpose of NAT was to alleviate the shortage of IPv4 addresses, but with IPv6, there's so many more addresses available that mechanisms like NAT are not needed. One thing to keep in mind is that IPv6 was developed almost 30 years ago, so while it's not yet fully adopted, some of the motivations for its development may already seem outdated. As we mentioned, the initial motivation was recognizing that the 32-bit address space that IPv4 uses would not be large enough to support the internet. And in the time since then, we have seen the IPv4 internet run out of addresses. At that time, there was also a concern about the computational complexity of processing IPv4 headers. And so a number of the changes in the IPv6 header were geared towards enabling those headers to be processed more efficiently. We'll see more in a minute, but we do note that the IPv6 header is 40 bytes, and this is because of the larger address space compared to the IPv4 header's 20 byte minimum size. Another goal was to pass the notion of flows down to the network layer. We've already discussed flows at the transport layer, where communication between a given source and destination port over a particular IP address pair constitutes a flow. However, a network layer device will not have visibility into the port numbers of the transport layer, but you might want to give it a notion of flows to allow for more intelligent packet queuing and forwarding decisions. So here's our IPv6 header. Of course, the number one thing that we notice is these enormous 128-bit addresses. So four times as many bits for each address, giving us room for unpronounceable numbers of IP addresses, as opposed to the 4 billion address limitation that IPv4 has. We have the version field in the same position as with IPv4. So if we start reading an IP header, we immediately find out whether it's version 4 or version 6, and are able to read the rest of the fields appropriately. Another new field is the flow label, which would allow the transport layer to differentiate between flows even though they're traveling between the same source and destination IP address. The exact definition of what the flow number should indicate is not well defined and left to varying implementations. The priority field allows the sender to indicate within a given flow a relative priority for packets. One can imagine that a layer 3 router would want to do preferential dropping whereby low priority packets are dropped first. We also have the next header field. This serves the same function as the protocol number in the IPv4 header. So it can tell us whether the next header is a TCP header or UDP header or any of the other layer 4 protocols. However, it can also tell us if the next header is an IPv6 option header. So we note that this IPv6 header is fixed length. It does not have optional fields. However, to allow for future innovation, IPv6 does support separate option headers that could follow the complete IPv6 header. So what don't we have compared to IPv4? but well, we've eliminated the checksum to cut down on processing time. Layer 2 protocols generally have much stronger checksum computations than the internet checksum, and so bit errors are much more likely to be caught at layer 2 than at layer 3. And with that in mind, it was determined that the layer 3 internet checksum was redundant in addition to being a very weak checksum. We also do not have any fields concerned with fragmentation and reassembly. Again, this is to take load off of routers. Instead of fragmenting a packet that's too large for an MTU on an output link, a router will drop the packet and notify the source with a new ICMP message called a packet too big. This ICMP6 packet too big message will notify the source of the allowable MTU size, and then it will be up to the source to remember that new size and reduce its packet size accordingly. So now we've seen what's changed. Why aren't we all using IPv6? Well, the truth is we all probably are in one way or another. It just hasn't replaced IPv4 yet. So we're going to take a little time to talk about the difficulties of transitioning from IPv4 to IPv6. As we've seen, the internet is composed of many different organizations all running their own routers, and it would be an impossible coordination task to get all of those organizations to switch over all at once. So while one organization may be able to transition their infrastructure, the coordination required of tens of thousands of organizations just isn't feasible. So the fact is that the network will have to operate with both IPv4 and IPv6 running simultaneously. This is commonly referred to as a dual stack network, meaning an IPv4 stack and an IPv6 stack running in parallel on the same devices. Another problem is when one organization enables IPv6, but none of their neighboring organizations have IPv6 enabled. So in that case, they would be unable to communicate with anyone else on the internet using IPv6, and that's where tunneling comes in. It allows IPv6 traffic to be tunneled inside IPv4 traffic across parts of the internet that haven't been upgraded yet the entire IPv6 datagram becomes the payload in the IPv4 packet. 
This is a good example of a case that might result in a reduced MTU. Because if we have an IPv4 packet with an MTU of 1500 bytes, that means we only have a 1480 byte payload in which to fit our IPv6 packet. So with respect to the tunnel, the MTU for IPv6 would be 1480. Tunneling is also a common mechanism used in other parts of networks. For example, a VPN is a type of tunnel. There are MPLS tunnels at layer two, and mobile networks, including CDMA 2000, 3G, 4G, and 5G, have all made extensive use of tunneling over IP. So here's a diagram with the complete IPv6 datagram nested inside the IPv4 datagram, which of course has a complete IPv4 header. The IPv4 header uses a specific protocol number to indicate that its payload is an IPv6 packet. So in our example, we have router A needing to communicate with router F, both of which speak IPv6 only. But in between, there's a portion of the network that only speaks IPv4. So B and E are going to be configured with a tunnel that allows them to encapsulate V6 traffic inside their V4 traffic. So our packets will start out as IPv6 datagrams encapsulated inside the layer two ethernet frame. We have some unknown set of routers in the internet speaking only IPv4 between the two tunnel endpoints. So those routers won't directly see the IPv6 traffic, they'll just see the IPv4 datagram that's encapsulating it. And so it will appear as a tunnel with IPv6 packets popping out the other side. So now our V6 datagram is inside V4, which is inside the ethernet framing. What this means is often when we do things like trace route in V6, we may not be able to see some of the routers because the traffic could be encapsulated while it passes through those routers. So we have our V6 traffic with its 128-bit source and destination addresses. Router B must be configured with a forwarding table that says traffic for this V6 destination gets passed to this V6 over V4 tunnel. We note then that the source and destination for the IPv4 header are just the endpoints of the tunnel. And so the routers in between reading the V4 headers just need to transfer the packets between the two tunnel endpoints. Then when this packet reaches its destination, which is E, the tunnel endpoint, E will know to decapsulate the contents of the V4 packet, which is again a native IPv6 packet, and send it on to the destination. So how well is IPv6 adoption actually working? Well, it depends who you ask and what you consider to be adoption. On one hand, it's unusual for an individual to send and receive all of their internet traffic over IPv6 only. For example, even when connecting to an IPv6 website, you may have used IPv4 to do a DNS lookup to find out the IPv6 address to connect to. Google publishes some adoption figures and shows that roughly 30% of its clients are able to access its services over IPv6. And according to NIST, about one third of all US government domains have some availability over IPv6. Note that on Google's numbers, they differentiate between native IPv6 and IPv6 where the client is tunneling over IPv4. However, in other domains, such as mobile carriers, some are reporting that over 90% of their traffic is using IPv6. And services such as the Apple iOS App Store require that all of the apps submitted must function over IPv6. This adoption has been going on for a long time, and we alluded to some of the difficulties initially, and another reason that adoption hasn't been faster is that it hasn't been absolutely required. Because of the widespread adoption of NAT, there is less pressure to get services working on IPv6 because we're able to make do with the number of IPv4 addresses available. That wraps up our discussion of IPv6. In the next video, we're going to look at software-defined networks and OpenFlow in particular. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.